myself, I'll start with a social prescribing update, very short, and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, um, Tim Horton. Then we've got uh, Hampshire County Council's coronavirus update from Nikki Ward. Then we have the Home and Well Project update from Alison Dean and Paul Bright. And then we move on to Hospital to Home Scheme, which is uh, via Sharon Knapp. Then I'm going to have a bit of a break from the visuals, and we've got three social prescribers from different areas in Hampshire who are just going to give us a very short two-minute update about social prescribing in their areas. Then we hand over to uh, Debbie Hayter, who's going to be covering a Hampshire response to COVID-19. And then we've got adapting social prescribing following COVID-19. As you know, COVID-19 and remodelling services is the theme, and that's from my colleague, Tim Cooling. And then at the end, I'm going to confirm the date and the theme of the next Hanson Isle of White social prescribing network. OK, so just of all, just first of all, really, to introduce myself. Now, looking down the attendance list, there are lots of people who are already members of the Hanson Isla White Social Prescribing Network. Um, you will know me, but there are some new faces who don't. So my name's Angela Gill. I facilitate the Hanson Isla White Social Prescribing Network for Community First and for Gospel Voluntary Action. I also work with um, Citizens Advice in Hampshire, and I'm currently working with the Clinical Commissioning Group for South East Hants fair and gosport so that's what i'm currently doing can i first of all say um welcome to those of you who've never joined us before this is a first it's the first time we've ever had a uh, hanson isle of white social prescribing network webinar so really really well welcome to this webinar i know that many of you are regular attenders um and i've already spoken to suzanne pepper for example um, Sam Roussos from the CCG rarely misses a meeting, so um, that's that's really cracking. And all the way from the Isle of Wight and Hannah Griffiths from Independent Arts, uh, quarter in, quarter out, she traipses all across the county from the Isle of Wight. And just today, she doesn't have to travel. So um, welcome to Hannah um, from the Isle of Wight. So... You probably know the webinar is being recorded. Lynn has told everybody uh, in the emails with the instructions, but I'm just reiterating, it's being recorded because not all of our colleagues and our members can make it today. So um, if there's any issues with that, please speak to uh, Lynn afterwards or drop her an email. But hopefully, because most of you are not having your cameras live, um, that should be okay. As I've uh, mentioned at the beginning, if you could now mute your microphones and your cameras um, now. If you're a presenter, obviously, that would be great if you could put your uh, camera live and obviously your microphone. And after the presentations, there will be an opportunity for a few questions. We've only got about five minutes after each presentation. But what I'm asking you to do on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see a little box on the top right corner. Um, that's your chat box. So if you open up your chat box, if you just put a queue, I can already see your name. So I'll know that you're going to ask for a question. And what I'll try and do in that five minutes is I'll ask you to speak. So just please be mindful if you are asking a question that if you don't keep it too long, someone else might be able to get a question in as well. Sometimes I might have more questions than I've got time for, in which case I've put a contact email for each organisation represented today somewhere in their slides. So if you can't uh, ask your question, I'm really sorry, but what we'll do is we'll ask you just to email your question remotely later um, so that you will get a response, hopefully. What we're hoping is that the webinar will be available via the Community First and Gospel Voluntary Action websites. Um, it, it should be ready by end of play tomorrow. So if you give my colleagues in both organisations a day to get the documents and the links set up, um, end of play Wednesday is when it will be available to ask colleagues or for you to have another look. 
please do share um, with your colleagues and with other service users or the clients that you think might be interested in today's theme. So I'm now going to start my short update. And the first thing I'm going to say is since I last met with you all, members that we met last time, um, there is now a new integrated community of practice. We call it an ICP, and it's a social prescribers um, network. And that's commissioned by the Fairham and Gospel and Southeast Hants Clinical Commissioning Group. So I'm going to call that a CCG. Um, and, and those meetings are, they were supposed to be face to face. But another thing that was affected by COVID-19, they are virtual meetings. We've had a couple, the first meeting, they're monthly, they started uh, in March, and it's really around um, support for the social prescribers in the Southeast Hants, Fairham and Gospel area. So we've talked about challenges, um, we've shared some really useful information. Um, it's supporting as well, the idea is for supporting each other in, in terms of social prescribers. But we've also started up a buddying system. So an experienced social prescriber can buddy with a, a very new, we've got a mix of social prescribers. So that's brilliant. Um, but what's really good news is my colleague Paula May uh, has, has given us permission basically to open the Southeast Hants, this ICP, the Integrated Community of Practice, throughout Hampshire from today. So some of our members are social prescribers, but not in Southeast Hants. You are now able to join the integrated community of practice should you wish to do so. Um, all you've got to do at the end of these presentations is my email. Um, all you need to do is drop me an email and I'll sort out with you how. There's also an opportunity in the future for some training and primary care networks outside of the Southeast Hants area um, are very welcome to buy in some training for their social prescribers. Many social prescribing services have remodeled and that's the whole theme of today's program. Um, and that's because of COVID-19. And I'm just picking one, one from my experience because as you may know from the agenda, I manage Gosport Voluntary Action Surgery Signposting Service and what we've done is we've blended and integrated that with Age Concern Gosport's information service because both operate from Gosport Voluntary Action's base. And what the surgery signpost of volunteers, we've got a team of about 10 volunteers. We've had three new ones recently. And um, what those volunteers do at the moment is they've turned their surgery signposting because the surgeries are closed so people aren't going in for those appointments into the fairly complex weekly befriending calls. And these are befriending calls that really the befriending volunteers haven't got the skill set or experience to deal with. Some of them have got mental health issues, a variety of complex needs. So that's how surgery signposting has almost transformed and changed temporarily. I've also been asked to mention about the Hydration at Home Toolkit. And that's a toolkit that's new and it's been designed by colleagues at Wessex Academic Health Science Network. And it's aimed at promoting good hydration, particularly at older people living in the community. And if you think about the shielding and the number of people who are in the older age range who are shielding at home at the moment, it's, it's really valid information. There's an information sheet and it includes a 40 minute or 45 minute link to some e-learning and that's aimed at carers in any capacity, paid carers or volunteer carers. There's also resources and there's some information for the general public as well. It will be circulated to all attendees at today's webinar, but also what we'll do is we'll put the sheet into the two website web pages. So that will be made available for you all. NHS England do a really, really good weekly currently um, social prescribing update. Um, and it's got all sorts of resources and useful information and other webinars. If you don't receive the update and you want to, I've just put in the contact details there for you. And similarly, the National Social Prescribing Network, again, 
due to COVID-19, it has a huge amount of information available. So I'm now going to hand over to Tim Horton, who's Chief Executive of Community First. Thank you very much, Angela, and thanks for the introduction. And good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see and to interact with those that I haven't, but I know that several of us have been on calls for many a time over the last few weeks. And um, yeah, it's great to be back uh, meeting as a social prescribing network, um, albeit virtually. Um, it's not quite the same as meeting face to face, but I hopefully you'll find some useful information from this afternoon's presentations. And I think it's really, really important at the moment that we keep social prescribing on the agenda. I just want to say a few very brief sort of words of introduction, really, and, and just set the scene that I think some of these points and issues will be picked up through the threads in the presentation. Um, one thing I would say as we go through this event, um, and for those of you that aren't so familiar with, with Hangouts, there is a chat facility available. And if anybody wants to make comments and things, you'll see a text box up in the right hand side of the screen. Um, and if you click on that, it brings up a chat column, um, which you can enter comments, ask questions and things like that as we go through. So feel free to use that if it's helpful. I know it's with such a large number on a call, it's not always possible to get um, a, a comment from everybody or, or comments and questions from everybody verbally. Um, the first thing I, I just want to highlight, I mean, Community First, as one of the CVSs in Hampshire, has really been at the heart of the voluntary sector's response to COVID-19. And I know we're going to hear shortly from Nikki from Hampshire County Council about the Hampshire Hub and the local response centres. And we're going to hear from other organisations that have equally been embedded in helping to mobilise volunteers and to deal with um, some, some challenges faced by those who are more vulnerable. Um, but one of the things that's really come to the fore for me is this the whole concept and the approach and the importance of social prescribing as part of that response. Um, and there's a couple of things I'd say on that. One is that it's about, uh, you know, helping people to help themselves. We know that a lot of people have needed support through the COVID crisis, have needed help with shopping, with prescriptions, with with other kinds of support. And particularly as we go forward through recovery, it's more and more about the checking in, the chatting, the befriending, the tackling, the isolation that people are feeling. And if people are fit on their own and are being told to stay indoors, whether they're shielding or just deemed to be extremely or very vulnerable, um, they're likely to be feeling that sense of great isolation. I think it's challenging enough when you've got family or people that you live with in your household but when you're on your own and those of us that have been at the front line of supporting individuals will know that it's a very, very difficult period for many. So the whole concept of prescribing contact with people, that social interaction is incredibly important. And of course, this week um, is Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, so again, it just brings to a fore the importance of conversation, the importance of having some human interaction and contact, albeit it's often through screens or over the phone at the moment, but that's invaluable. And it's only telling those of us that have perhaps been on the ends of call lines and call centres and actually spoken and, and seen just the the, the willingness that people want to talk, they want to say things, they want to tell you about some of their situation, their family, um, they want to share their experience and we mustn't underestimate that. And social prescribing is really at the heart of supporting people in that way. I think what we're also learning is that there is people are experiencing significant complexity of issues facing them. What starts as a request, and albeit a fairly kind of modest and humble request for some help with some shopping, quickly can kind of lead on to a range of other support issues, whether it be with underlying health, whether it be with a financial situation, whether it be with family circumstance, a whole range of issues that are impacting people's lives and quality of life. And volunteers who are at the forefront of this are being exposed to that and doing their very best to support people in very complex situations. But this needs to be a team effort and is very much a team effort working with professionals in, in adult services in Hampshire County Council, indeed in Portsmouth, Southampton and the Isle of Wight Council um, and dealing with professionals in other organisations and of course with our colleagues in the NHS and through the CCGs. But what we're also finding, I think, through this is that there is significant 
fragility in some people's support networks. And by that, I mean that, okay, COVID is a, is a crisis that we hope never occurs again, and we could never really have reasonably predicted would occur in the way that it has, although pandemics, of course, are not, not unique and, and do happen from time to time. Um, but what's happened, I think, is just exposed that actually, although we've got some incredibly powerful, strong communities in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, Actually, some people are extremely vulnerable. And if one bit of their network falls by the wayside, perhaps a family member who themselves is isolating or who can't do their shopping, they've actually got nobody. And that, that's the fragility, I mean. So again, the emphasis on social prescribing to really kind of reinforce the need for people to build networks and for us to sustain and help sustain people's networks. It's very much this concept that I know Hampshire will say about, about the strengths-based approach. What we want to avoid in going through this situation is that we end up with a significant dependency culture where people are wholly reliant on those volunteers. So we need to really recognize the role that social prescribing is going to play through the recovery phase of COVID and how we can rebuild people's networks and expand people's networks. So in the future, if there is a need to put in place mass support, there are better mechanisms already embedded and better uh, networks already there. Um, clearly, there's a, an opportunity to... Um, I think, to expand our network of social prescribers. I know that there are specific uh, funding pots and, and funding available through the primary care networks to fund the link workers and the social prescribers that exist and embedded within PCNs at the moment um, and alongside working alongside GPs. But I know that with some of the funding that is available uh, to support organisations through COVID, a number are looking at recruiting, bidding for funding for wellbeing coordinators and similar roles. And I think as this network continues, we want to look at what those roles entail, how they dovetail, avoid duplication, of course, but use this as a springboard to see if we can really expand the, the offer around social prescribing across the county and further afield. Um, I've mentioned access to funding and, and of course as part of the follow-up to this group I'm sure many organizations have already got one but if you don't we've produced a list at Community First of all of the funding opportunities that we've identified and that can be shared uh, with other organizations. I think there are a significant number of opportunities most of it is to respond to COVID but increasingly new funding is being made available to actually look at the recovery phase and what we might do going forward, certainly over the next six to 12 months and indeed longer than that. And I'm personally very interested in working with organizations in partnership to access some of the larger funding pots um, and to, uh, yeah, just to really see what we can do um, uh, to uh, build capacity and consistency across the county mm -hmm. and indeed further afield across the Isle of Wight. Um, I think there are too many occasions where in our rush to try and do the best we can, we're missing a little bit of a trick still across the county in not accessing some of those larger funding pots. There are, for example, uh, funding pots available for loneliness fund. I know there needs to be a bit of qualification as to exactly who's eligible for some of these. And of course, some of them have very short deadlines. But these are things that we should be looking at and as a network we might find of course not everybody around this virtual room but a significant number of partners may find that we could bid in i know that particular fund for example looks for umbrella organizations that could bid in on an area basis and then delegate funding down to other organizations to deliver and that might be the sort of model that we want to follow as a network going forward and finally, just to say, and as I've said at the beginning, the, the, the CVSs, uh, the councils of voluntary services have been instrumental in that coordination role, working alongside Hampshire County Council and uh, indeed the borough and district councils, as well as clinical commissioning groups and other NHS bodies to uh, mobilise volunteers um, and to support groups who themselves are mobilising volunteers. Often these are mutual aid groups, but sometimes they're existing groups that have developed and evolved to uh, provide that, that much needed support. And I would urge any of you that want to find out more about that, and I know Nikki's going to say a few words and speak in a minute about the um, local response centres and the Hampshire Hub. But if you want to contact your local CVS, they can plug you into all of the local networks, often district by district, are having local coordination groups. And I know that social prescribers have played a significant role in those that we've been facilitating and leading on. And we'll make sure you've got all the contacts for your local CVS by way of follow-up. 
So that's all I want to say, but thank you very much and I'm looking forward to this afternoon's session. Great, thank you very much, Tim. And I'd now like to introduce Nikki Ward, who is the currently, this is a seconded role, the Local Resource Centre's Relationship Manager. Thank you, Angela. Hi, everybody. Um, some of you will already know me as a Community Connector Delivery Lead for Hampshire County Council, but as was just said, I've kind of taken a bit of a move into a new role at the moment to support the work that's currently going on in Hampshire to support the coronavirus situation. The first thing I wanted to say was actually that it is still business as usual as such for Hampshire. So the work that I'm going to tell you about is some of the new things that, that we're doing, but it, it's not to replace our, our normal services. We have had heard stuff around social workers working anymore and things like that. But just to reassure you, everybody is slightly in a different way, um, as most people are, but services are still in place to support people who are vulnerable across Hampshire. So the first thing to tell you about is the, and you may already be aware, about the Hans Help for Vulnerable Helpline. Doesn't roll off the tongue. Um, this is a helpline that is now up and running across the whole of Hampshire, doesn't include the unit trees. Um, however, it is there to support vulnerable people in Hampshire. It's open seven days a week from nine to five, and it basically acts as a triage service. So there's sort of three main functions of the helpline. The first is just basic signposting information, and about a third of the work tends to be that. So it is linking people into things such as CAB to support with finance, etc. We also have a triage system. Therefore, if anybody has complex needs or is particularly vulnerable or at risk, so if it's a safeguarding issue, et cetera, they can be referred through to our internal welfare team, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a minute. And they will offer extra support and link into adult social care systems and services as is our normal business. And the other area of work, so if the person isn't particularly complex but is needing support on the ground, um, they will get referred to one of 11 LRCs, as they're known across Hampshire, which is these local... We either call them response or resource centres, and I keep flicking between the two, so both do the same thing. Um, and we have 11 of them across the county. So in terms of how we are supporting the extremely vulnerable shielded group, basically internally at um, adult social care, we've set up a welfare team that are dealing with these cases and supporting them. So we have the helpline, as I've just mentioned, but we were also given a list from the government um, originally of approximately 30,000 people who were living in Hampshire that fitted the criteria for the shielded list. And we were asked to contact all of those people to do a welfare check, see how they're doing and see what their needs were. So we did that in a number of ways. So through phoning people, we did big sort of text drops, emailing people where we had an address, but as you can imagine, that's quite a complex piece of work that took quite some time to get on board. Um, and so we have had support from our local LRCs as well with that. We then got a further 20,000 um, more recently added to the list. So we've now got approximately 50,000 people in Hampshire that meet that criteria. That isn't to say that all of those need, people need support. The majority of them are managing through friends and family. Um, but the rest of them, we link into the LRCs where appropriate or internally to Hampshire um, Adult Services, if it's that what they need. So in terms of the local resource centres, we have 11 that sit with the district kind of geography across Hampshire. And as Tim was saying, they're a partnership really between ourselves at Hampshire, the district and the borough councils and the CVS network as well. And it's really, really good to see everybody working together in order to kind of coordinate and create this response on the ground to support these vulnerable people. Majority of the work is still around um, helping people to access food um, and to also um, get prescriptions, medication deliveries. Just one thing I did want to say around the food is the government food parcels are not coordinated by either the LRCs or ourselves at Hampshire. These are centrally supported at government. So we have the data and, ha and the LRCs have the data on who's expecting them, but we aren't controlling those contracts. So it's, it's a bit of a myth out there at the moment because we get lots and lots of inquiries about it. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, in terms of the medication delivery, we've done lots of work with pharmacies alongside health to try and improve the access for volunteers um, and also to increase capacity for delivery 
for people as well. And sort of echoing what Tim's already said, we've had an absolutely amazing response from volunteers and the councils across Hampshire. Everybody's been fantastic and moved into this space really, really quickly and social prescribers to um, make sure that people are supported on the ground. One of the things we're really lucky in Hampshire, we have more volunteers than we have work for at the moment. Um, but as we move into recovery, we are starting to think about the access to volunteers who may well themselves be going back to work or um, changing what they're able to do. So that's something we will be considering during recovery. In terms of my role, I'm a relationship manager. There's three of us and we are supporting each area um, through various different ways. So how we are supporting the LRCs is with things like from adults, health and care, safeguarding information to make sure that all of those pop up groups, those really local mutual aid groups are really aware of how to safeguard and how to support people and where to go for help should they need it. There has been some um, we've worked really closely with public health throughout this as well. So we now have um, delivered a set of volunteer guidance which supports this work. So it's really clear around safe collection and delivery of prescriptions to make sure that, you know, it's things like you don't post it through the door. You must make sure, sure somebody picks it up, et cetera, et cetera. We've also got mental health guidance that we've pulled together to make sure people know where to go to access mental health support and mental health, health services are still running and have capacity. Um, they also have a really clear route back into adults health and care as well. So anybody that they're concerned about, they can clearly refer back to ourselves. Just a quick reminder, Connect Support has got some really, really good COVID resources on it to support people. Um, and we've also doing some work at strategic level around the pharmacy stuff and food as well. And I think I just heard Angela ding. So I think I've reached the end of my five minutes. So that's just a very brief whistle stop tour of what we're doing in Hampshire. Thank you very much. That's, that's brilliant. Thank you. Super. OK, so we've now got a couple of minutes, uh, four, four minutes or so to ask any questions that you might have of Nikki. So um, I'm just going to have a little look and see if anyone's put any. Okay, so let's have a little look. Do, do, do. Nikki. Right, uh, Suzanne, you've got a question up. Do you wanna do you wanna ask your question, Suzanne? Uh, yeah, really quick really quickly, Nikki. The responses yes. are across Hampshire, are they? Um, have we got Ooh. one in our area? Gospel Fair, have you got that? Yes. Okay. Yes. And the second question is, is actually a plea. Can you <laughs> make it very clear who you are when you're phoning and contacting these people? I'm doing triage calls. They say, oh, I've had so-and-so room. You're somebody's And they have no idea who's rung them, who's supplying them food, who said they will pick up their meds. It's very, very confusing, particularly if they're under a bit of stress. You really, every organisation has got to make it incredibly clear who they are. I absolutely agree with you, Suzanne, and it's one of the real challenges with this piece of work is there's quite a few organisations involved. So, you know, at, at Hampshire level, we're doing the response to the list that we've been given by the government. But what we also know is that GPs have been supporting that work um, by get it, contacting their vulnerable people as well, as have organisations that would normally support people. So things like day services have been, you know, contacting their people. Um, and I absolutely agree. We need to make sure people are clear because the other thing is, is well, there is a government set up helpline service, which is also contacting shielded people as well now. So there's plenty of people in this mix. It, it's one of those, it's a really tricky situation. There's part of me that feels I'd rather have them, them having more phone calls than none so that we're not missing anyone. However, I completely agree. We do get people that are very confused about who's phoned them and for what reason. So I'll take that message back. It is something that we are consistently working on, but it's there's lots of people in the picture. So yeah. I'll continue to push that message because I completely agree with you. Super. Thank you very much, Suzanne. And Nikki Stavely, um, I've got a question for you. Sorry, I just wanted to say, Angela, it does open the door for those with um, less than honourable intentions in amongst this confusion to turn yeah. up and say, yeah, I'm doing a shopping, give me a card and a checkbook. Yeah, good point. Thank you. OK, over to you, Nikki. What, for a response? No, Nikki Stavely. Uh, I've got oh, a right, question. Sorry, <laughs> I said too many Nikki's. I've got sorry, Nikki Stavely has logged a question. Are you there, Nikki? 
Okay, don't worry, there might be a problem with the microphone, so I'll ask the question. Um, she's asked, do you have an idea how long the Hampshire Health Line is continuing? Yes, it is currently um, going to be running what we do know is until, at the moment, the end of September. Lovely, thank but you. But that obviously um, will be reviewed. That, that's super. And I have a comment from Helen Fisher, which says there are six in Southampton too. OK. OK. We've got one minute left. Any other questions? Great. Thank you very much, uh, Nikki Ward. And we'll now move on. So I'd like to hand over um, to my colleague, Alison Dean, who is the Stakeholder Engagement Manager for Scottish and Southern Electricity Networks. Thank you, Angela. Can you hear me OK? We can, yeah. Lovely, that's good, thank you. And good afternoon to everybody. Um, just in case you're looking at the side, I come up as David Dean. I am actually Alison Dean. Um, I'm just using some personal software because my company has blocked um, Google Hangouts. So avoiding the confusion there. Um, Home and Well is a project that was initiated by Scottish and Southern Electricity Network based on previous good practice and a project that we had at the Great Western Hospital in Swindon and also through some collaboration in Scotland. It's aimed at those transitioning between hospital and home, or may already be in the community, who would benefit from a wraparound service of financial and life benefits that Citizens Advice can offer, which also includes registering onto the Priority Services Register. Um, SSEN approached Citizens Vice as a delivery partner and the project now also includes Southern Water, Portsmouth Water and the CCG. Some of you may not be aware perhaps of the role that utilities have in supporting vulnerable people in the community. Um, SSEN provides the power to your homes through cables and wires in the way that Southern Water provides the water to your homes. However, if you are without them, this can add additional complications, particularly at this time when people are self-isolating or shielding and unable to leave their homes or have people visit them. They may find themselves in increasing vulnerability if they are without power or water. So imagine how much more difficult it is if you are living with any of the conditions that you see on your screen, if you found yourself without power or water. And um, to give an example, um, Southern Water shared with us the other day, they had a major water pipe burst and 30,000 homes were without water. They only had 500 people, vulnerable people, on their priority services register. So in trying to support those people, it was incredibly difficult if they didn't know where they were. And some people got really quite distressed. So we really want to work through the Home and Well Project to register people onto the Priority Services Register so we know about them in advance and we can be giving them proactive support quickly rather than reactively delayed support. So the fact we have 50,000 people in Hampshire that are extremely vulnerable, it would be really great to find a mechanism how we could know about them in advance should there be power or water outage. So I'd now like to hand over to Paul Bright, who is the CEO of Citizens Advice Hampshire, who's going to tell us more about how Home and Well is delivered remotely. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. And 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 welcome from my little box in the depths of, of Hampshire. Um, just a, a brief trot through where we are. Um, due to COVID, we, the, the project was supposed to be frontline working in hospitals alongside staff and helping to uh, get discharges quicker and, and help to stop people coming back into hospital with similar issues and those many many of them being social um, as opposed to clinical we've had to change and uh, what we've done is and if you could go to the next slide please uh, what we've done is we've equipped all of our advisors and a lot of our volunteers too across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight with remote access to video conferencing to uh, obviously phones and email and we also got a web chat as well and so what people can do now is they can refer to the service remotely and we offer 
as you would expect from system device, debt, unemployment, benefits, those sorts of things. And by the way, someone mentioned employment and it's a really hot topic with us at the moment. And of course, universal credit too. And we know that uh, in the fullness of time, there will be a number of people who will have housing issues where at the moment people are being given furlough for their rent, but it will come a time when they have to pay that back and they may not be able to. So I think we're going to have people like that um, coming to us as well. Also, we're helping with utility bills and fuel poverty, poverty and sign up as to the support service register, as Alison already alluded to. But if we can't help, we'll find somebody who can. And that's, again, what I think we've got a good connection with all of our colleagues within the, the community and other services around that can help people with their concerns. So the way it works quickly, uh, NHS staff, frontline staff, find somebody who is potentially what needs some help with um, yeah, the housing or whatever it be, but also and they can see quite clearly that there is, uh, they're a lot vulnerable and vulnerable doesn't mean they're old and cranky like me. That means they are actually vulnerable at that time. So it could well be that they are just incapacitated through a, a broken leg or whatever it be. So they don't have to be old. They can be incapacitated or in some way vulnerable at that time. And so we can sign them up to the register. There's the flyer that's going round to frontline staff. That, <clears throat> if you click on where it says simply click here, it goes to a referral form, which you can see on your screen. And that can be filled out by frontline staff. It comes to a central point within Hampshire, uh, Citizen Device Hampshire. And we then contact our colleagues across the county in the Isle of Wight to deal with that client. And that's pretty much how it works. So the benefits, and there goes the bell. The benefits, um, as you can see on the screen, our hope is that, of course, it does give less demand on the NHS and we actually help them. Uh, but also, of course, the patients and clients that we offer that sort of wraparound service. And uh, it's a flexible approach. And we're still looking at what we can do differently uh, to give remote, remote support. So any further information you need, the next slide will give you information for that. Uh, the project coordinator is someone called Elaine, and uh, she can be contacted on those details. Thank you very much, Paul. Okay, so you're getting the hang of it now. It's over to you. Any questions for Paul, please? I think a okay, so we've got. So, sorry, we've got. I'm just looking down the chat. So if you could pop it into the chat. Uh, da, 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 uh, I think Alison wanted to say something. No, no. Oh, I just had a couple of questions that come in on the chat. I was just trying to help Angela. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we've got Vicky. Would you like to ask your question first? Oh, hi. Yeah, I was just wondering how we get a hold of the flyers. Uh, they've gone out to as many people as we can find within the NHS, but please contact me or Angela and I will gladly send you the flyer. OK, thank you. Vicky, they tend to be, they're not physical flyers, they're, they're electronic. So what we're doing, last week I was circulating them to all of my CCG and NHS colleagues. So we can easily send you uh, the electronic version. Um, Brilliant, thanks. Tim, uh, and Tim Vicky, Horton. And Vicky, um, please share. Tim Horton, if you'd like to ask your question. Oh, thanks, Angela. Yeah, and Paul. Oh. Excellent scheme, just exactly what's needed. So credit to, to Citizens Advice Hampshire and, and to SSE and, and other organisations for the support in that. Um, I just wonder, Paul, we'll be, we're finding people in the situation where they've recently been discharged from hospital, but it probably preempted the scheme and therefore they wouldn't have necessarily been referred into it, where clearly they do need some support. People with issues with identity bills, um, they might be having ongoing treatment, particularly for COPD, they might be, you know, having oxygen cylinders that they have to be plugged into constantly. Um, and, you know, can we refer in, can the voluntary sector refer in, does it have to be through the NHS side of things? No, How, no absolutely just, right, Tim. Yeah. No, I think you're, and that's really good, a good, good point. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if there are people in the community that need that yeah. support now, then we can do that collectively, uh, right. you know, on behalf of the the utilities and also, of course, system advice. So yes, please, Tim. Thanks. Can I just also a plea with anybody that's got medical equipment? 
it's really really important to try and get them on the priority services register even on like a hot day this afternoon somebody who doesn't have access to power for anything um and a skin or whatever is really important so anybody who can help that would be brilliant thank you Alison. and maybe again as part of the follow-up to this if there's any reminders about the contact details for those sorts of things it's just so helpful at the moment one of the things that i know groups find really challenging is looking at so many different organizations websites to try and pull the right information together and you almost go to somebody with a whole bundle of either physical or or electronic flyers to say here's what you need to know and if we could somehow consolidate it into you know and, and add it to that piece of information or just yeah find it easily that's helpful but yeah definitely needed Lovely. Thank you very much, everybody. So I'm now going to move us on and I'd like to welcome Sharon Knapp, who is the Head of Wellbeing Services for Age Concern Hampshire. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you, Angela. And hello to everybody. Uh, welcome to my loft. This is where I've been stuck out for the last eight weeks. Um, I'm here to tell you about Age Concern Hampshire and in particular one of our projects that we've managed to keep going during the COVID crisis. Um, it's not as well known as some of our other projects, but we're working in partnership with Southern Health and Hampshire Hospitals Foundation Trust. Um, and we've put four members, five members of staff into four community hospitals across Hampshire to work in their rehabilitation wards. And um, two, at the moment, two of our staff are working from home because of their own health. And we've got three members of staff actually going into wards currently. OK, thanks, Angela. Next slide. So this is how it works normally. <laughs> the idea of the scheme is to speed up the process of rehabilitation and discharge. And we do that by providing activities on the ward that helps to get patients away from the, their bedside, gives them things to do um, like a breakfast club. So they start to get used to preparing their own food again, doing group activities, get them discussing things, a bit of mental stimulation, a bit of gentle exercise and uh, get visitors in like um so the patient there is holding a little rabbit we had a visit from pets at home and brought in some small animals for the for the patients to hold so that was a a very popular activity and they our staff work with the hospital staff and the social workers on the whole process of discharge and they get to know the patients on the ward and they can sort of help to preempt some of the issues that patients will face once they're home Get them connected in to other services that they might need and help the connection process for them and the links to the community they get students in from local colleges doing their placements and local schools will come in to sing and and they do networking with local services so that's all changed of course none of that can happen at the moment one of the big changes that is the rehabilitation wards um, many of them have turned into medical wards in Gosport uh, Hospital, we've got patients with COVID-19 in isolation rooms. And at Alton Community Hospital, the, the whole rehabilitation ward was um, a, a COVID positive ward for a time. And our, our staff member there had a dose of coronavirus early on. So when she went back to work, she was able to, to go onto that ward and work directly with COVID positive patients. Um, so the side rooms, they've been in some hospitals, there have been extra beds squeezed in wherever there's space for them. So the side rooms that used to be used for group activities are, are now little wards, uh, ward bays. And so the group activities have had to stop. And it's not something that's really appropriate for patients to do anyway at the moment. So what our coordinators do has changed. They're providing companionship with patients on a one-to-one -one basis at the bedside. And of course, they have to put on all their PPE equipment uh, and it's very time consuming to sort of refresh your PPE every time you move from one patient to another. So it's quite a challenge for them. Uh, but they're helping out on the ward as best they can, taking some of the pressure off the nursing staff. Liaising with families has been a big thing of, of what they've been able to do. And that they can uh, take a, a phone around and allow patients to speak to their family members because of course there's no visitors going in. And I would think that if everyone around you on the staff ward, on the ward, is covered in PPE, it must be quite scary, a little bit confusing for, for patients who are not at all well. 
So being able to phone your family member or even do a video call uh, has brought face smiles to faces. And I've heard some lovely stories about how it's been really appreciated by families and patients. Um, so there are some good things happening. Um, the wards are getting food gifts. At Easter time, there were Easter eggs everywhere. Um, Domino's are still bringing in pizzas. Uh, in Gosport, they've had a batch of airline meals provided. And, uh, and many of these gifts are sort of going home with patients as appropriate. <clears throat> but there are new schemes being set up in the community. There's a pen pal scheme with the Cubs and uh, shopping. Apparently, getting someone to do the shopping for a patient after discharge was one of the hardest things to do. But of course, now there's there's lots of options for people offering to do shopping. So that's actually becoming easier. <clears throat> and the wellbeing course. So Age Concern Hampshire runs day centres, but they're all closed at the moment, of course. So our well, our day centred staff are doing wellbeing phone calls to, to older people once a week. <clears throat> and we can include discharged patients in that scheme and give them a phone call once a week, check they've got everything they need and that they're, they're doing okay. So we've been very fortunate really <clears throat> to be in a position to support the NHS through this period. And uh, thank you, that's, that's the end of my little bit. Great, thank you very much, Sharon. Okay, so as is usual, um, if anyone has any questions, <coughs> could you type just uh, your name or the question into the chat facility and um, we can facilitate that for... Just having a look. Okay, uh, Tim Horton, would you like to kick off? <clears throat> yeah, sorry, I feel like I'm I'm slightly hogging, but I've got just because it's it's so topical, really, at the moment. But hi, Sharon, good to see you. Um, yeah. it, it, are you are you at capacity mm -hmm. at Age Concern with this scheme, or can you take more referrals? But obviously, just in those hospitals that you're covering, presumably. And are there any plans? Uh, to expand the service at all or is that something you're keen to do subject to funding we um it's the referrals don't really come in from outside the hospitals it's something that is uh, managed within the wards um we would like to expand and <clears throat> we had plans before the covid hit of opening another ward you know and seeking some agreement with one of the foundation trusts for that of course that's sort of been put on hold <clears throat> and as with any of our um, our projects, you know, the funding goes from year to year and we have to just work within that framework. That's super. Thank you very much. OK, any other questions before we move on? OK, I'm just going to flick back to um, Paul's presentation. Um, Rebecca Davies has said, Paul, um, it will be good to have the flyers available for the LRCs too. So uh, just pass on. If you hadn't seen that, I'm just going to pass that comment on. Lovely. Thank you very much okay, indeed, thanks. Sharon. OK, so now we've got the three social prescribers that I mentioned. We're going to have a, just a couple of minutes. There's not going to be questions. It's really for us to hear um, a snapshot in time. We're going to start with Donna Simpson, who's the lead health connector for the extended primary care team for Southern Health NHS Foundation Trust. Over to you, Donna. Hi, can you hear me OK? Yep, that's fine. Thank you. Hello, hello everyone. Um, so the extended primary care team, we're working in Fairham, Gosport and South East Hampshire. Within the team, we've got clinical staff as well as health connectors who are social prescribing link workers, essentially. So we're still supporting people over the age of 50 who have long term health conditions. And we're still providing um, a lot of our support, some of it face to face, if, if that's needed, if we feel there's a need to go out and visit somebody. Um, but we're able to do a lot more over the phone. And we've been providing some of the essential help, um, such as collecting medication, getting emergency food supplies or shopping. Um, but what's really ramped up is our work around liaising with other services. And that really is, is any service that people need. So liaising with colleagues in primary care, community health teams, with adult health and care, and really um, brilliantly with the voluntary sector, actually, across the whole, the whole patch. Um, we've had a lot of referrals for some of those people that have been identified where when a volunteer gets to know somebody a little bit, there are some other unmet needs that present themselves that then get referred on to us and we're able to support with that part of that person's care um, whilst the volunteer still does the shopping. So we've been working really closely with our 
colleagues across all sectors. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Now, people are welcome to put comments in the chat as, as I move from one to the other. So um, thank you very much, Donna. And I'm now going to hand over to Ollie Lester, who's the social prescriber or health coach for Coastal Medical Partnership at Arnwood, which is in New Milton. Over to you, Ollie. Yeah. Hi, Angela. Hi. Um, yeah. So I've been working my way through a list of shielded patients and phoning them along with uh, help from a few care navigators and just, yeah, it's just social check-ins, making sure they've got access to food delivery, medication delivery. And if they haven't, uh, we've got a really good volunteer uh, support group in New Milton that's been uh, really helpful. Uh, that's my first resource really above um, or ahead of the Good Sam app because, yeah, there's not much red tape to get a volunteer out. Uh, and they also offer like dog walking and, um yeah social phone calls and web chats for anyone uh who needs that so that's been really useful and uh, i've also just started another low carb zoom group and uh it's, it's it's a support group um with yeah with food at the heart of the uh solution really for a lot of uh, health problems so i'm just kicking off another group uh, and i know some of my other sort of friends involved in like low carb groups are in winchester and bathing folk as well so that's been quite a nice side project to, to do proactive or take proactive steps to um, support your immune system in this time of uh, viruses and that kind of thing. Um, and I've yeah, been dealing with uh, anxious patients from doctors who uh, yeah, don't have enough time to deal with one to one sort of anxiety through through this uh, Corona era. So, yeah, that's been another um, yeah fulfilling part of the job as well. So that's pretty much what I've been doing. Super, thanks again. It's just really interesting to hear different dynamics and different people, what they're doing from different areas. Um, and I'd now like to hand over to Nikki Judd, who's the Programme Manager for SO Linked. Over to you, Nikki. Hi there, um, thanks Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so I, I'm working on the SoLink project, which is funded by the Southampton City Council and Southampton CCG, um, social prescribing, community navigation and community development. Um, so initially, uh, a, a vast majority of the calls we were getting were about people accessing food and prescriptions, and also anxiety about how they would do this when, when they needed to, even if they didn't currently need to. Um, and a lot of uh, local organisations had really adapted their services um, and support so, and there were different needs coming to the fore. So what we started doing was posting on our website about current services and this has grown into quite an extensive sort of online directory of services which health services and the voluntary sector and individuals are saying they're finding helpful for finding what currently services are offering because as we've heard already uh, a lot of them have uh, had to adapt and done so brilliantly um, in recent weeks. Um, so, for example, local organisations were telling us their clients were struggling to get delivery slots. Um, so we, we did a big push with our local area teams um, and community development, finding out where people could access this support and putting it on the website. And that resource has helped us to help people to help themselves and find their own um support networks and develop those support networks um so that hopefully people are able to um to yeah ha have something sustainable and be able to like self-determine which is um, something we'd always encourage um so now there's been an increase it, that's slowed down a little bit and there's been an increase in people seeking help with pre-existing conditions um as people I hope uh, sort of getting the message that the services are still out there for those things and it's not a case of oh, someone else is worse off than me, so I don't want to bother anyone. That's, I think that's something that we, we constantly need to um, get the message out that we are still here and the voluntary sector is still open um, for business. Um, and there's loads of creative ways that volunteers and communities and voluntary organisations are responding. Um, and our local area teams in each of the six areas are key to linking people in with those, like initiatives on streets, street level, street groups, um, Right, yeah, right up to, to citywide services. Um, and we're also looking at the moment at a piece of work around helping people get connected through tech and addressing some of those digital inequalities because as more and more stuff is online or over the phone, that becomes even more vital for people. 
Really interesting. And again, three very different stories from social prescribing. So um, thank you, all three of you. Thank you very much indeed. Any comments, do feel free to pop them onto the chat uh, side there. And I'm now going to invite Debbie Hayter, who's the service manager for the British Red Cross, to um, start her presentation. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to um, see um, some of you, at least I can see the names, if not the, the, the faces. Um, yes, yeah, so um, as the introduction said, I, I, leave, um, I lead some of the frontline services in um, the Hampshire area. And this is a, a sort of more general approach about what the Red Cross has done in Hampshire and also a little bit nationwide. Um, what is a very apparent with the Red Cross is that each um, areas of, of the whole of the UK are all doing slightly different things. So I'm going to be focused obviously on Hampshire um and we'll just see um but there are other works other pieces of work going on around i think um like nikki said earlier for us the, the story is um the same is that business is a, is as usual for us um, but we're just adapting to new ways of working um and I also said i know we've also mentioned about pp and that's part of our new ways of working um and moving forward um, but one of our strengths has always been flexibility and rising to a challenge quickly um, and quite quickly when this um, pandemic started and people's uh, the lockdown happened uh, we were quite fast to response to respond locally as I'm, as was a lot of the community groups as well um, joining us I think one of the other additional um, resources for us is that we were able to pull a resource of volunteers um, and um, we also had um, the ability to have redeployed members of staff from other areas in the Red Cross to support our frontline work. So our capacity and support levels internally were far greater to help us meet the capacity of the needs of the work that we were, well, we were doing. What we found with partnership working is that there are some sort of uh, charities and community um, groups that have um, evolved and we've really linked in and we're working really closely with them and we've also found that some options um, are, are now becoming active but we're put on hold for a bit so but but now as the lockdown goes on we're, we're finding pathways where we can still tap into some of those supports of of services that weren't able to go to homes and we weren't able or, or had too much capacity not enough capacity to take on new referrals so those are have seemed to work themselves out of it and we're now working a bit more with um community groups that were put on hold i think some of the nicer part of working in the community uh, with other community groups and the partnerships is where um, we've had some lovely um, pieces of work where we've joint worked. I remember that we we phoned a family once that was so isolated and they completely ran out of food and were desperate. And we just rang at the right time. And with the help of the local food bank, they were closed at the time we called, but they managed to open up, uh, grab a food parcel for us that we could deliver to that family on the same day. Um, and the food bank agreed to support the family going forward. So it was, there's some lovely elements of, of joint work and some lovely stories about how um, different agencies have come to support, but in a joined up way. We also have this uh, um, GP um, social prescribing and the GP practices. Um, and like many of you, the part of that list was to for the GPs to identify um, any of their vulnerable patients, but not necessarily the vulnerable patients on the government's shielded list, but anyone that they um, felt was vulnerable in their patient day. So they worked out a criteria to, um, to find a list of patients that we could then ring and do wellbeing calls on. Um, and in, in total, we had over 2,000 uh, wellbeing phone calls to make from four of the clusters we were supporting. With that, we found that a third of them uh, needed some kind of intervention, whether that be medication collections, whether that be shopping, and whether that be getting um, patients stuck at home that couldn't get out um, to essential blood tests um, for their, uh, as well as their well-being needs. We did with the other two thirds that had support in place that didn't need us straight away. We um, linked up with, we, we kept contact with them because we found that even though they were quite well supported, there might be times where their support network weren't able to um, support them so therefore we would step in for that short term to, to to fill that gap until their support network came back into place. I think um, one thing that the Red Cross has found uh, the strength in particularly the link workers and the clusters and within the GP practices um, it, it's 
a being able to bring in knowledge back into the GP surgery of what's happening in the community and working with them and giving them more information that they can update their databases for information I think the other thing is it's been quite strong to have a nice t a pool of people around so we can bring strengths of all our team of all our team together um, to meet the demands of the phone calls and, and what's needed in the area um, our home from hospital service um, we had a bit of a, a downward trend in referrals where the patients um, were not going into the hospital so non-essential operations were cancelled so therefore we did have a lull of reduced referrals coming into the system but we also had problems where we couldn't move people on as quickly so we've had sort of people that we would normally support for longer periods purely because we couldn't move them on into the community to other resources we're, again things are changing all the time in 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 the work we're doing and, and the resources available to us and and, and the community groups um, and what they can offer and capacity so things are always moving um but I, and we've now also began to see an increase of some of the referrals as obviously the hospital needed to look at the priority patients that they had at the time to support the relief in the hospitals we have increased our transport home services so we're offering more transport for patients um, home from hospital to home um, part of the advantage of that is that we found that there's a lot of dispersed um, patients in the community and particularly working with social care teams we found that um, a patient instead of going into acute hospital may have been sent to a care home may have been sent to an uh, another home to recuperate or recover and then there was an issue about how the social care team were going to get them home so in some areas we've been able to tie in with social care teams to identify those patients where there's no patient transport going in but we can then go in and collect them and take them home rather than having to organize a taxi i'm going to move quickly on um just to let you know obviously the red cross have also uh launched um their um the national uh, a, a, a helpline it's very similar to nikki's and i just want to say that even though it's a different helpline that's very similar these things can potentially work very well together um moving on to the next thing i'm not going to talk about the concerns but these are just some of the things that we've come across in our work i think that what the only thing i didn't identify on here was about young people struggling um as in because they can't meet their friends and social media only goes so far and i think there's some young people that are really struggling with um some of those connections and finally on recovery um it's going to be interesting to see what the the future holds but obviously um the gp practices have already uh diversified offering digital triage appointment systems um, and virtual responses by text and email so a lot of changes have already happened in the short time um of the the lockdown and that will obviously be strengthened i believe going forward i think part of our role is to see whether we can expand locally to offer more support because there's going to be a high volume of patients needing support um and, and, and as, as we know, social prescribing will be a key element um, for that recovery stage. I'm going to leave it there because otherwise I'll just talk on. OK, thank you very much. That was really interesting. And it, you've done really well to fit into a lot in, into a short time. So um, let's have a little look at the chat. Is there any questions? Let me have a little look. Uh, da -da -dum. OK, so da -da -dum. lots of nice comments. Uh, anything ah, specific for, for Debbie? They're all thinking, Debbie, because there was a lot of content there. It was really interesting. Thank you. <laughs> OK, any observations or comments to do with Debbie's presentation? If there's nothing, don't worry, because people can come back to me later, um, you know, if they've got any questions or queries. Yeah, obviously, they're, they're absorbing it a, a, as we speak. OK, <laughs> no okay. Worries. That, that's absolutely fine. Thank you very much indeed. We're now going to move on to the next presentation which will be Tim Cooling. So I'd like to introduce Tim Cooling, who is Head of Strategy for the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Partnership of Clinical Commissioning Groups. Over to you, Tim. Hello, good afternoon. I um, hope everyone can hear and see me. Um, the great thing about going last is that you get to uh, to hear about all the great work that's going on. And I've just put a comment in there um, on the back of Debbie's uh, Debbie's presentation, because, of course, what you're picking up is, I think, what we're all thinking, which is actually there's so much great work that is happening across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. I think we're really fortunate to be in 
a system that um, is so willing to collaborate with each other. Um, and it's some of the things that I've been involved with, with local authorities, voluntary sector, the, the, the effort that people have been putting in has been um, phenomenal. Um, and I guess as we all sort of move beyond COVID into the new normal, um, I think we're all, we're all looking at, wa at ways that we can harness the good work that we've, uh, we've been working on and, um, and capture that and, and move that into the, the new world. So, so yeah, all great stuff. Um, but a bit of a background about uh, us, obviously, in the, in the clinical commissioning groups. Um, earlier on in the year, there was a number of things that we, we'd identified as strategic priorities, um, working with the voluntary sector and social prescribing is, is part of that. Um, and so by way of background, really, the, the four things that you can see uh, were the four things we were, were really trying to, to push on. Um, mental health services, obviously, really, really important. Um, and unfortunately for us, we had a really good um, workshop plan down in Fairham and Gosport um, uh, for last month, which we had to cancel. Um, but that was really, um, we were going to really kickstart how we were, we were going to address mental health services in the community. Um, uh, we're looking to get that up and running again as soon as possible, working with, with partners like uh, Solar Mind um, and the CCGs and the local authorities. Um, hospital home services, obviously we've heard about them, um, all the stuff Action Hampshire talked to us about today. Um, we also were working with local authorities um, around the, the existing community connector models and Nikki Ward, who we've heard from today, um, had sort of various meetings with her and, um, and other partners to think about our social prescribing offer um, across the patch. Um, and then lastly, we were really keen to, to boost all the preventative activities that social prescribers could refer into. Um, working with partners like Energize Me. Um, and so just moving on to the next slide, um, it shows you some of the sort of progress we were making um, before the world went upside down. Uh, I always like to, that's my phrase at the moment. So um, the Community First were really helpful in sort of helping to coordinate um, meetings across um, some of the strategic partners in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. And a number of us had got together to really think about um, the role of the existing social prescribing network um, and how we could really boost that and build relationships um, across the whole system. Um, there's loads of great work that's happening in, in different parts of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, but, um, but not all of it is necessarily coordinated. So we were, we were trying to make an effort to pull some of that together um, and that was really helpful. Um, we've been having discussions about um, streamlining our commissioning arrangements with the local authorities. Um, so health, obviously, as big commissioners locally, local authorities are uh, the other big commissioners. And um, a lot of the stuff is happening uh, in duplication. It's like I say, it's all, it's all been good, um, but there are elements where we could just be more coordinated. So we'd started the process of trying to, to rationalise some of that. Um, and had conversations with people like uh, Tim and Angela about the role of the social prescribing network going forward and um, how great it is and how we could evolve it to um, to deliver uh, some of our sort of strategic priorities in health. Um, so that's kind of where we got up, up to, as it were. Um, and then we've obviously gone, in, gone into COVID and been thinking about, well, you know, all the different things that social prescribers have been, uh, been doing. And it's been great to hear from people like Ollie um, uh, and Nikki kind of working uh, at the coal face to see how they've they've adapted their uh, their practice and so thinking about the future you know what elements of, of what we've been hearing you know can we carry forward into the into the new world and and, and, uh, and change the way that we do business with with patients so so it's just three very brief things I wanted to, to sort of touch on really and of course we've all become um, super users of, of technology uh, over the last couple of months whether it's zoom teams Google, you know, Google, whatever, uh, Skype, there's, there's almost too many options, aren't there? Um, and people obviously at the coalface have been uh, interacting with patients in, in a totally different way. And some of that's been, been really good. Um, obviously, there are certain challenges around it as well. But, you know, I'd really be really keen for social prescribers as a, uh, as a discipline to really think about how, how, they, uh, how they do their practice and, and how much of this technology can they carry forward into the new, new world. Um, you know, is there an opportunity for, for people to uh, increase the, the volume of contacts that they're doing? You know, because what we're trying to do, obviously, is reach out to our most vulnerable people. Um, and technology is a really good enabler of that. It obviously doesn't work perfectly all the time. It's not appropriate in all circumstances. But I guess there is an opportunity to think about 
not being totally dependent on face to face. Um, you know, and I think a lot of health and care are sort of thinking about that and reflecting on how they might reach out to people in new ways. And obviously it gives um, social prescribers themselves opportunities to work differently in their own practice, you know, potentially working from home, um, working remotely, doing all, this, all, all the low carb Zoom chats as Ollie referred to, so all those group consultations. There's, there's actually a whole sort of wealth of possibilities that we could move into. So it's trying to get people to, to sort of capture that uh, and think about what's the best um, the best practice that they've been doing recently and how much of that can they take forward. Secondly, um, what are the opportunities to move into a more of a personalised care um, approach um, as part of our interactions with people who are who are vulnerable? We've heard about you know, reaching out to people on the vulnerable list. Um, nationally, there's a really big push to, to get people on uh, personalised care plans. Um, I think nationally they want something like 750,000 people to have a, a personalised care plan by uh, over the next couple of years. Um, and so it's, it's sort of moving, moving beyond just treating that immediate need with someone, but to actually um, uh, actually look at them holistically. And I know I'm, I know I'm talking to people who are probably doing this already, but um, as we know with social prescribing, there are so many different ways that people practice this. But I, I'm really keen that we try and embed that personalised care approach with people to think about moving them to a stage of being able to manage their own care um, to take control of their own health conditions um, and that's what's going to be really interesting particularly as um, we touched on already today people do start to, to think about presenting again with their underlying health conditions um, once once sort of you know covid becomes um, a bit less in the community so and thirdly, um, how can the network, obviously, that we're all part of uh, today, help to support um, social practitioners? And it was great that, uh, Andrew, you opened up, obviously, talking about the, um, the South East Hand Social Prescribing Network um, and the community of practice model, because that's something that we've been talking about um, in terms of providing a, a, a training um, vehicle for social prescribers to, to, to access the things that they will need in their practice. Um, and I guess speaking to uh, and hearing from uh, social prescribers today, you know, it, there's all sorts of challenges that, that people are, are faced with. Um, we think in health, mental health is going to be a big, a big challenge for everybody kind of going forward. Um, and so, you know, the question and the challenge to us all is, you know, are social prescribers equipped to, to deal with some of that stuff? Um, what, what role can the network um, and the community of practice play in um, supporting those social prescribers to help them feel equipped um, to deal with people who have got mental health issues potentially, um, whether that's about rolling out a programme of, of making every contact count training, MAC training or, or equivalent. Um, I think it's just really good that we um, acknowledge that social prescribers can often be, be practising in, in isolation and we need to um, need to support them. So really good to hear about all the stuff that, that's happening down in Fairham Gosport as a sort of first wave um, and I'm really pleased that that offer has been opened up to the rest of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight social prescribers as well. Um, and through that, sharing good um, good ideas about boosting referrals into social prescribing, really embedding social prescribing as part of the multidisciplinary team within primary care, um, and, and boosting the um, sort of boosting the profile of the of the profession, obviously as well within um, within primary care settings as well as other elements of voluntary sector who might refer in as well. So, um, and I guess just uh, as Andrew again alluded to that the uh, the buddying element that the network can provide um, to make sure that people aren't feeling isolated, they've got some sort of um, mechanism where they can uh, support each other, um, and all of that's going to be really important going forward. So, I'm really keen to to keep having those discussions with people like Tim and Angela um, and local authorities to, to see how we can develop that further. So very exciting times. Super, thank you very much indeed. And uh, as, you, as you said, Tim, um, the social prescribing, the Southeast social prescribing sort of network for social prescribers, um, the CCG have already developed a framework and there is also a, a training needs analysis, but where we're at at the moment, because we thought if we'd have been meeting face to face, we thought we'd be doing uh, some sort of discussion around that TNA, but at the moment, um, the social prescribers are in a slightly different place. So it's slightly paused, but there is training available. And we talk about that. The next meeting virtually will be facilitated by myself, 
on Thursday. So any social prescriber who wants to join and be part of that um, webinar on Thursday, please, please let me know. Okay, yeah, so I'm going to... I'm gonna... as well, sorry, that um, I'm really keen to hear directly as well from social prescribers about what they feel their training needs are as well. I'm, I'm very conscious that we don't want to be imposing a programme onto people who it feels like it's not actually relevant for them. So, you know, I'm keen for the, for the network to explore ways of, of getting that feedback as well. That'd be really important. Super. That, thank you very much. Right. I'm just going to have a little catch up. Oh, there's lots of questions for you, Tim. OK, so uh, let's have a little look. Um, Alison, do you want to, is your, your question for Tim? I guess it's more in general, I think, probably from there, is that um, what we're trying to do as utilities is to help the resilience of individuals so they don't get deteriorating health. And therefore, the only way we can do that is to know where people are and what their circumstances are. And I've heard so many people interacting with groups of people. And inside I'm going, oh, if only we knew about them in a power outage or a water outage, we could be so much better serving them. But we understand, dare I say, that SSEN are not the right people to contact those people to put on our priority services register. So the home and well collaboration is fantastic. But there are lots of other people interacting with those folks that would be really great to see if there was a way. We do have web forms. It's not all leaflets. But it's no good leaving something with somebody. I guess everybody knows it's just not a priority and people don't fill in forms it's how can we help them and to sort of get the people that are visiting our vulnerable people to kind of come on board with the benefit that we could be supporting them with i guess so yeah. don't know if that's tim one or not <laughs> <laughs> and what's, that, that, it, what's been interesting for me actually over the last um uh, couple of months is seeing uh, all those uh information governance barriers sort of suddenly tumble away. Um, I think it's been interesting to see how people have suddenly been able to, to collaborate and to share information uh, in ways that they felt more restricted to before. So that's one of those sorts of things that I think we, we need to hold on to, um, make sure that we're, we are obviously sharing appropriately, but that we're sharing um, with the right people, absolutely, so that we can get the right interventions at the right time. So um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think the, 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 the network itself can play a role within that. And, and following on from this webinar, there will be information circulated. So um, a link to priority services registration online is not beyond the, the realms of what, what um, my colleague Lynn Dudman can do, Alison. So um, at the end of this, we will be obviously playing through the webinar again. And uh, I'm sure Nikki, Stavely, Tim, um, Lynn and myself will actually work out how we as a network can respond. So um, I'm very aware there's a, a long list of questions. So so let's have a little look. Um, Nikki Stavely, uh, do you want me? Uh, are you able to I, I ask the question? You, I think you can hear me now. Can you? I can. Yeah. Off you go. Yeah. Um, I, Tim, I was just wondering. Um, we're uh, running the local hub in in Gosport. We're seeing mental health issues becoming more and more prevalent. How are you proposing to give local hubs like us more support? In what way, Nikki? Sorry. Can you well, just... we've got a number of volunteers now dealing with with people with long term mental health problems. We haven't got huge number of places to send them. Silent Mind is one. Um, uh, the Moving On Project for our younger people are, is another. But um, we need we need more advice and more support about how we're going to deal with this we probably need more training actually absolutely and and um, obviously alluded to that a little bit earlier around yes. you know, training for i think anyone who's coming into contact with um with patients uh, and for ourselves to be to be brutally honest we're you know there's an element where we all kind of need that that support at the moment um i mean i was going to say so that mind obviously is a key partner uh, of ours we've been having conversations with them about um, their offer uh, and they've been crucial in trying to pull together some of the partners in that part of the world to have more joined up conversations and uh, as i say unfortunately some of that had to be put on pause um but as we kind of move to uh working with covid and having to live with it for a while um 
absolutely that mental health offer needs to be available for for everyone in the community um it, it, and you, fairly urgently tim I, mean, I was just going to say so i was going to say if if, if there are an urgent issue with um with people like solent mind what what are they saying to you when you you contact I think, I think you know that we we are running out of places to go and um so i don't know what solent mind is saying generally but maybe there is going to need to be more support and more i haven't heard recently about italk and what their capacity is and how much they're being able to help but i i'm very happy to do some more research about it and maybe we should all be doing some kind of survey about the needs so that we can be ready because i think they're going to increase as people leave, lose their jobs um as furlough recedes so i think we need to be aware of that yeah interesting there are a couple of points just coming up about italk and referrals it, it, it seems like there may well be a bit of capacity at the moment which is which is great news um but you're absolutely right about the um the need for those services increasing going forward and, and that's why i mentioned it specifically earlier because i think as a system um we need to think really hard about um how we support everybody within it who's practicing and supporting patients um, and make sure we've got enough capacity. There are there are there are numerous bits of think of work happening at a national level, at a southeast region level, and then discussions happening uh, around with the mental health commissioners at Hampshire and the Isle of Wight level. Um, as you can imagine, all these things need to try and tie together. But your the mental health is absolutely on on people's radar within health. Super. Um, I'm aware that Nikki's got a second question, but um, Suzanne Pepper, I'm going to go through people who haven't asked the question for you, Tim. So Suzanne yeah. Pepper, would you like to ask him your question? Yeah, two issues, really. If you are promising so much as a governor of Southern Health NHS Trust, gives the money, Gov, <laughs> and then you can do more. ITALK is up and running, Nikki. They do have capacity. As with all of the community mental health work, they need funding. One of the issues that it would appear that everybody has is that there's no overall top-down view of what is available across Hampshire. People are still sort of fumbling about it. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, could we have that? Is that a possibility? So in terms of the Hampshire and Isle of Wight view around mental health services, um, there are obviously a number of people who, are, who do mental health full time as part of their day job. Uh, I'm not one of those, um, but there are people who obviously meet across the whole of, of Hampshire and Isle of Wight as part of the um, uh, uh, Strategic uh, and Transformation Partnership, the STP, which some of you may well be uh, familiar with. So um, there are people who, who do have that oversight. But what we probably really need to make sure is that we're, we're connecting it into what's happening at, at a local level and that all people operating at a local level feel part of that process and are able to feed in their concerns. Super. OK, um, Tim Horton, I can see a question from you. Would you like to um, ask your question? Uh, thanks, Angela. Sorry, I was just trying to type, type another comment <laughs> at the same time. Um, I think it was just Tim for a bit of clarification around the personalised care plans. I think that's an excellent thing to look forward to in terms of supporting people again on that strength-based approach. Um, as it might not be for this topic, and it, but it, I just wondered if we could have a bit more information about the process for how patients adopt a personalised care plan. Is it a GP's responsibility to do that for them, with them? Is it the patient themselves to request it? Is, it, is there a role for the voluntary sector in encouraging that? And how do we go about that? Yeah, and I guess there's, there's not going to be one size fits all, is there? Um, like most of these things, mm. like one size fits all to how we deliver social prescribing. Um, and so, you know, I'd be I'd be loath to say there's an absolutely one way of doing it. I, I guess ultimately, um, patients' care plan sits with their general practitioner, um, and obviously, social prescribers are working often in, in tandem with their DP practice um, and and delivering that on behalf of them as part of their kind of primary care function. So. Um, I mean, again, I'm not no expert on delivering personalised care approaches. Other people uh, do that. Um, but what, what I think we're really keen to move towards is, is just uh, a mindset of, uh, of moving people on, um, on that, their particular journey. Um, 
and I, I see social prescribers as being sort of front and center of delivering that. Um, and that's how I think social prescribers can really um, raise their profile within the system. Um, because, you know, whether, whether we like it or not, there are kind of national uh, drivers around trying to boost numbers of people who have personalized care plans. And, and these are things that, that are important to, um, to government and to patient care. So I think we need, you know, just need to probably have, have, a, have a stock take of where what, what work social prescribers are doing to make sure that if that is a if that is a strategic priority for us as the system we we give very sort of um specific steer to our social prescribers to say look you know th this is the kind of stuff training in um and to become confident in um and to feel empowered to be able to lead people through on their patient journey um and getting patients to take kind of ownership of their their long-term health conditions so and i'm just to totally aware that people are going to be in very different places around that some are some are going to be doing that anyway um others uh, won't be so i think that's where the role of the network can come in in time to support um with with the training um in in that so super thank you thank you very much um alex walker i can see a question from yourself about uh uh referrals so do you want to ask the question yeah so um I work for Hampshire Cultural Trust and have a, a project that was up and running just before lockdown. We were due to start working with referrals in May, but can't do that because all our sites are closed. But thinking ahead to when we are back and open and we're able to offer projects, working with our collections, with our exhibitions, with artists, that kind of thing. How do you see us being able to share what we're doing with the social prescribing network? Because ultimately we're at the end of that patient's journey getting involved in a project and you know um building up confidence gaining skills but it, it's really how we get those projects out there and known about sure and actually it's probably probably better for someone like uh tim or angela to actually answer because um they're key they are absolutely key in disseminating that sort of information so. yeah well, what we tend to do alex is um we circulate through lynn dudman if there's information and flyers and posters we share that with our members and as you can see today, what we also do is we have themed um, normally their meetings, but at the moment it's themed webinars. So we invite partners in particular themes to come up and give a sort of short presentation. So I'm um, very happy to have that dialogue with you. Um, we can liaise, drop me an email, and we'll work out how we could raise that awareness uh, when the time's right. Is that okay? That would be great, yeah. Thank you. Can Super. I... Uh, there's, there's two comments from um, both Nikki and uh, Suzanne Pepper about the shielding list. Do you, Nikki, do you want to ask that question about the shielding list to Tim? Yes, Tim. Um, we are very, very keen to see the names and addresses of people who are shielded because we want to be able to prioritize them. We want to avoid duplication and we have, and we want to be able to support them in the best possible way without those names and addresses as Surrey, Surrey for example, uh, County Council has given those to their trusted partners in the voluntary sector. I don't know how we can avoid fraud um, and how we can support those most in need. Yes, and it's an interesting point, isn't it, around information governance. I, I guess ultimately we do need to still be careful and mindful that we are talking about patient records. Um, and obviously we can't you know, be posting them on uh, council website for all to, to, to see. Um, but there are groups working at, in, within local authorities who have access to that information um who who are looking at ways of, of, of getting the right care in at the right time so for hampshire county council for example and uh, tim uh, and nikki uh, particularly involved with with the sort of uh, supporting the vulnerable groups um within the patch um so the the voluntary sector is is very much represented in that space um so uh, if there are any uh, any ways that that information can get out tim i don't know whether um, there's something you can elaborate on about the work that Hampshire has been doing. Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing I'd, I'd just add, I mean, Nikki and I have I've spoken a little bit about this already, but but um, I know one of the issues that, that Hampshire, Hampshire really are the ones as a county council that, that sort of hold and have 
you know, got the list of those that are shielding uh, across the county and, of course, other uh, parts of our network in Portsmouth, Southampton, Unitaries, and indeed the Isle of Wight will hold their own lists. Um, in the early days of, of COVID and, and, you know, up until certainly the end of April, early May, um, and as new shielding groups uh, get added or individuals get added to the list, I think there was some concern that, um, if the lists are shared, you end up with duplicate contacts to very vulnerable people and retaining a single point of contact into that family or that vulnerable person was absolutely critical. Um, I, I, I think there is some argument and I, I think there may be ways in which information can be shared. So the local resort response centres will know through the referral mechanism from the Hampshire Hub, which of those individuals that have been referred how, are shielding and that information can be shared as part of the local response centre with, for example, the CVSs, so GVA, obviously it wouldn't be expected to be shared any further. So any referrals my organisation gets in the five districts that we cover, we're always told if somebody is shielding and therefore we've got a list of those that have been referred into us that are shielding and we can match up support accordingly. Okay, I'm going to have to step in now because I'm very aware of time. So thank you for that um, very brief response, Tim. A um, couple of comments before we move back to the last um, couple of slides. Ellie's um, highlighted that iTalk have got um, reduced waiting times at the moment. Uh, we've also got a link there for Alex with Hannah. So that's really good. They've they've linked up over the, uh, the arts side, which is great. Uh, Jenna says if there's mental health issues, if they're very high, they should be seeing their um, GP. Jody has made a comment um, concerning Andover Mind. They provide carer support and dementia advice service countywide. So it may be worth um, a conversation to see how there could be more partnership working. So again, Jody's put her details there. So thank you very much. I mean, that was uh, amazing in terms of the connections in, in just about uh, 10, 15 minutes worth of questions. So I'm so pleased we had a little bit of capacity at the end. I was very kind and let us overrun um, because I think it was really, really valid. There's lots of points and I've seen some of Tim um, Horton's comments. So we're gonna look quite carefully at what we've covered and what's been raised. And it's the start of a conversation in some respects. I wanna formally say thank you to all presenters. A big thank you to Lynn, who's been recording today and has been doing a lot of practice. None of the PowerPoint presenters could come today without going through a practice with myself and Lynn. So they put quite a lot of effort and work. Thank you very much. And also thank you to the audience because there's no point in today without having an audience. It was really, really, really good. Um, it was the first webinar. So please do feedback. If you haven't have to go, it's now 2.30, so you may need to leave immediately either feedback through the chat about the format, the structure, um, did we get it right? Did we have enough speakers? Should they speak longer, shorter? Just give us general feedback because that feedback will shape the next webinar. Um, and again, theme ideas, please. Always open to theme ideas. I talked about sharing information and we always do that for those of you that are new. Lynn Dudman will regularly share information to network members. If you're not a member and you'd like to be a member, please liaise with Lynn via email. And as I mentioned, the webinar and the associated documents are going to be available on Community First and Gospel Voluntary Actions websites by end of play tomorrow. Now we were due to go over to the Isle of Wight in tribute to Hannah, who comes over to us, but we postponed that simply because we're hoping that the Isle of Wight colleagues may easier be able to access what we cover here. So at the moment, our next um, webinar will be on Tuesday, the 8th of September. It will be 1 to 2.30. And you may not believe this, but Tim, Nikki, myself and Lynn already chose social isolation uh, over six months ago as the theme. And boy, is it going to be topical in September. Um, there is going to be another date for your diary, 1st of December, more information to come. Now, there's a big gap between May and September, and there's going to be a lot going on. So we're going to keep communicating. Um, Lynn and myself are probably going to pull together a sort of a newsletter, um, the first Hanson Isle of Wight Social Prescribing Network newsletter. We will share updates and there will be documents that will circulate. Um, you've got Community First website details there and Gospel Voluntary Action. Um, my email address and Lynn's e email address is also there. 
So all I wanted to say is please um, do put your comments on or email myself or Lynn later with your feedback. Um, any Anything that you think would improve it next time would be great. And can I say thank you very, very much for joining us today. Thank you, Angela. Thank you for sharing so well. Thank you. I've been quite strict. <laughs> Thanks, Angela. Thank yeah, you. Thank have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Angela. That was very, very, very good. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.